Numerical data is one of the two types of data inside every computer program, and we use numerical data to represent the outside world. Let's take a detailed look at numerical data inside computer programs. This video is all about numbers. Now, I know what you may be thinking. I'm probably not gonna watch the whole video. I hope you're wrong about that. If you do watch the whole video, let me know what you think at the end. We'll kick things off by looking at numerical data inside computer programs. This will introduce us to integers and decimals. Then we will push forward and explore just how numbers are used to represent and interpret the outside world through counting and measuring. And this will set us up to examine how numbers are represented inside the computer. This is the path or what I like to call the storyline that we'll be following. And after this is complete, you'll have a broader perspective when it comes to numbers. Whether it's numbers inside a computer program, in the real world, or under the hood of a computer, this is definitely worth your time if you're trying to level up. Oh, you are so right. And thanks to your smooth salesmanship and your silver tongue, I'm completely sold. Okay, so check this out. There are two general types of numerical data inside computer programs. We have integers and we have decimals. And let's just go ahead and be honest. This is probably something you've been exposed to in some shape or form already, but hang with me. Integers are numbers that don't have fractional parts, while decimals are numbers that have fractional parts. Decimal numbers have a decimal point that separates the whole part from the fractional part. The reason we call the point a decimal point is because, well, deci means a tenth, and each digit in the everyday numbers that we are used to dealing with represents a power of 10. Okay, so suppose we're inside a computer program and we want to refer to an integer, like say, the number of stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We just literally type out the number in this case. And for the Dow Jones, this number would be 30. If we want to refer to a decimal number, we do the same thing, but we add a decimal, which gives us a fractional part. The fractional part can be zero. So for the Dow example, we would just write three zero dot the decimal zero zero for the number 30 in decimal form. Something you'll notice about these numbers, both the decimal and the integer, is that we don't put them inside of quotes like we did for strings. This is how we distinguish the text 30 from the actual number 30 inside computer programs. The number is not in quotes. In the real world, we use integers to count things and we use decimals to measure things. And these acts of counting and measuring allow us to make sense of the world. Consider this scenario. At the moment, we have a flock of zombies headed in our general direction. Given the circumstances, we are certainly going to be using integers to count them out. Looks to be about 15 individual killers. Okay, so what do we do next? If we're going to survive, we need our fight or flight response to kick in. What most people would do next is whip out some decimals and start measuring the distance between themselves and the closest zombie. This is Survival Basics 101. Distance functions are powerful here, let me tell you. All right, so let's do it. The closest zombie appears to be about 12.456289454. Right. I know what you're thinking. Are we really about to sit here and measure out some distance to 10 decimal places on some zombies? I'm thinking the nearest decimal point will do on that one. And this is how we handle most measurements. We're only as precise as we need to be given the task at hand. In both of these cases, counting and measuring allow us to know what the deal is. The point here is that counting is done with integers and measuring is done with decimals. With this in mind, let's think about how data is represented underneath the hood of a computer. If we want to represent numbers ourselves, we have two basic ways of doing it. We can visualize the number in our mind, like in the zombie example, or we could think about it in a more calm environment where we'd be able to write the number down on a piece of paper. This option of writing a number on a piece of paper is what I want us to think about. When we write numbers down on a piece of paper, we do it digit by digit. And when computers store numbers, they also do it digit by digit. The digits we use depends on the number system we're using. Computers express numbers using the binary number system and humans express numbers using the decimal number system. There are 10 digits in the decimal number system and each digit in a number from this system 
represents a power of 10. In the binary number system, there are two digits and each digit in a number from the binary system represents a power of two. Let's look now at two constraints that affect both binary numbers and decimal numbers. The two constraints are range constraints and precision constraints. When a computer puts a number into its memory, it's very similar to the process of writing a number on a piece of paper. The paper can only fit a finite number of digits before all the space runs out. This is also the case for computers. Computers can only keep track of a finite number of digits. It's a lot, but it's still finite. Stick with me and let me show you what I mean. Integers have a range constraint, and the range of numbers allowed depends on the number of digits available. If we have three digits available to us, for each digit there are 10 possible values, 0 through 9. By varying these values, we are able to represent different numbers. We can represent a thousand different numbers. We can represent 1 through 999, and we can also represent the number zero. This gives us a thousand numbers that we can represent using three digits. Decimals, on the other hand, have a range constraint and a precision constraint. Suppose we have a total number of three digits to work with and a decimal point. The range and precision of numbers we can represent depends on where we place the decimal point. If we move the decimal point to the left, the range goes down, but the precision goes up. And if we move the decimal point to the right, the range goes up, but the precision goes down. This property is known as the range precision trade-off when floating the decimal to the left and floating the decimal to the right. When the decimal is all the way on the right, we don't have very much precision. We can only represent integers. But if we move the decimal one digit to the left, we can start to gain some precision. We can actually represent numbers with one position after the decimal point. If we want to have more precision, we need many more digits on the right-hand side of the decimal point. It's a trade-off. It's kind of like mo' money, mo' problems. The main message here when it comes to numbers is that there are two primary types, integers and decimals. We use integers for counting and we use decimals for measuring. Inside computers, the range and precision that can be represented is limited, but this is no different from what we are used to in real life. If there's a flock of zombies incoming, there's going to exist some max number of zombies we'll be willing to count before we're toast. And this also applies to measuring distances with extreme precision. These constraints are one of the main reasons programming can be intimidating. Sometimes there are a lot of options when creating numbers inside computer programs. If you see this, just remember it's all about range and precision. And most of these options are just variations that have been introduced over the years as computing has evolved. But don't let this be intimidating. Just remember counting and measuring and think of the range and precision required for the task at hand. Hit the comments and let me know what you think. If you like this video, check out the channel, and of course, uh, do feel free to stick around.